our, our first speaker will be John Monson, who is from the University of Rochester, and we're uh, happy to have him present on the presentation and differentiation of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Thank you very much, John. Um, so we're going to start off quite gently. This is not going to be too challenging. And actually, in many respects, has nothing whatsoever to do with laparoscopy. Um, but nonetheless, some of these things uh, warrant uh, repeating at times. So for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease for the laparoscopic surgeon, what are the issues? Um, well, I think the issues sometimes relate to the patterns of disease presentation, strategies, investigations, therapeutic decisions, and Actually, does it always matter whether they've got ulcerative colitis or Crohn's? And the answer to that is sometimes no, because um, the clinical presentation uh, overcomes um, subtle differentiation. Some of these issues are related to laparoscopic surgery, and some are related to simple clinical care of patients. So we'll run very quickly through uh, the presentations um, and start with acute colitis where patients, of course, as you know in your day-to-day -day practice, present with some version of these three terms, toxic megacolon, fulminant disease, chronic failure to respond. And to a great extent, they're simply degrees of the same thing. These are patients who are usually quite sick. Um, and when I mean chronic failure to respond, I mean somebody who's been in a hospital for two weeks rather than a 10-year history. Um, so these are usually inpatients um, or patients who've been admitted recently. You'll all be familiar that these are usually presented on a Friday quite late in the day by gastroenterologists who say they've just noticed that they're not doing very well. Um, and usually when you look at them, they've been doing not very well for quite some time and are really quite sick with low levels of nutritional status um, and are certainly in need of fairly urgent intervention. This is probably the one group in which, to a greater or lesser extent, it doesn't really matter whether they've got Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Um, but there may be some pointers to Crohn's disease, such as rectal sparing. Obviously, if the patient has CT evidence of small bowel disease, um, it's much more likely to be um, uh, Crohn's disease. Perianal disease, fistulae and fissures may indicate this, but it's not actually um, a definite given that if they have that, they have uh, Crohn's disease. And then, of course, extra gastrointestinal manifestations, um, uveitis, iritis, things like that, mouth ulcers, um, will uh, maybe uh, give you a hint towards what's going on. But remember that ulcerative colitis is far commoner as a presentation in this acute way, and it essentially doesn't matter um, because the surgical options are really quite limited, at least um, in uh, my practice, and uh, I think many people would recommend a total colectomy with endileostomy. My personal bias is to avoid mucous fistula, but I know people like doing that. I don't like it because I think the, patient, the patients don't like them uh, a lot of the time. And I, I just don't like leaving um, a quite an amount of colon, but I think it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. This operation is ideal for a laparoscopic approach because you're probably going to go back into that patient at some stage, and you can do it very easily with a hand port, or you can do it very easily um, with a total laparoscopic approach. Um, yeah, both operations are somewhat boring because you've got to walk your way around all the colon um, but I think the patients do benefit from this, particularly as they uh, are not that, uh, not in great shape, a lot of these people, and the minimizing trauma, I think, is, uh, benef is beneficial. The final pathology of the colon will usually, but not always, uh, answer the question. Um, and it's really the only option, uh, namely a temporizing total colectomy if the patient is on steroids or actively on biological therapy. There's good evidence to show that patients on Remicade, for example, have a much higher incidence of post-operative morbidity um, uh, than those who are not. 
as I say, uh, performed laparoscopically, I think um, a total colectomy allows, uh, produces a significant reduction in adhesions for subsequent surgery, whatever that might be, and allows further choices of incisions, again, based on what you're proposing to do. And it's probably the best indication for a hand port um, because it probably does speed things up a little. Chronic colitis, I think, is sometimes a difficult call. There are some red flags, again, for Crohn's disease, perianal disease, aspirated rectum, patchy disease, strictures, deep ulceration, and the non-GI uh, problems, especially mouth ulcers. All of these would tend to give you a strong hint that this patient may have Crohn's colitis. Um, but it's sometimes impossible to tell despite your best efforts. One thing I would always recommend is that uh, regardless of who did the pathology, I would double check it again before considering an IPAA um, reconstructive pouch surgery. Uh, we're all brought up to believe that if you do a, uh, a pouch on a Crohn's patient, it's inevitably a disaster. Well, it's not actually inevitably a disaster. It can be, of course, and some patients only declare themselves as having Crohn's disease when they've had a pouch fashioned. But in ballpark figures, uh, the overall pouch failure rate in UC is about 10%, and in uh, Crohn's disease, it's only about 30%. It's not an absolute catastrophe. Um, it's not really an issue in these patients if you're proposing to do a proctocolectomy and stoma, because one way or another, that colon is coming out. There's a slightly murkier area, which is the area about the granulomas. What about the patient with the occasional granuloma or indeterminate uh, colitis? I think those areas are still controversial. There are strong advocates for reconstructive pouch surgery um, who, would in, who would suggest that this is probably some version of attenuated Crohn's disease. Um, and I would suggest that, therefore, the results are still slightly unpredictable in these groups. Um, but it is worth having a dialogue with the patient, I think. Chronic Crohn's uh, colitis. Um, the, my one word of warning would be to never do a segmental colectomy, regardless of how tempting or easy. The recurrence rates are prohibitively high and often quite rapid. These patients need their whole colon taken out. The question is, what do you do with their rectum? Um, and even though it's an operation that was around in the 50s and 60s and went out of favor very dramatically, I think um, it is probably worth re-evaluating the option of ileorectal anastomosis in selected cases. I think these patients need careful counseling and is best avoided in patients with very active disease of the rectum. But in a young patient with a spared rectum, um, I think it has some advantages. As long as the patients understand, they will almost certainly end up having further surgery to remove their rectum and may end up with a stoma. And that second operation may come quite soon, sooner rather than they would like. But as long as the patient is willing to take that risk and roll the dice with you, I think it is sometimes a beneficial operation. Small bowel disease, of course, is an easy call. It's essentially always Crohn's disease. And as I'm sure we'll hear in much greater detail later on, this is ideal for a laparoscopic approach because it minimizes um, cosmetic issues. There's, we know from good data there's no increase in recurrence rates, and it's ideal for the younger body-conscious uh, patient. The resection is usually easy. Strictureoplasties, I think, are much more challenging uh, on a laparoscopic basis. In my personal hands, I have found that patients with an enterocutaneous fistula, I usually cannot do that laparoscopically unless it's a, a very simple, straightforward one, but I, I think that's usually not the case um, from my personal experience. But internal fistulae may be possible, whether it's an enteroenteric fistula or, for example, a enterovesicle fistula. I think those are much more manageable and at least worth exploring laparoscopically. Periandal disease, as I mentioned before, is a red flag for Crohn's disease, often associated with small bowel disease, and therefore the patients do always need a full GI evaluation. 
It may, of course, simply be innocent and a coincidence, maybe nothing to do with uh, Crohn's disease. And local biopsies of the um, fistula or the abscess site may actually lie to you. And just because they're negative does not mean the patient does not have Crohn's disease. So in summary, therefore, I would suggest to you that um, differentiating between um, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease is usually fairly obvious, um, but not always. It's mostly not a laparoscopic issue. It's uh, um, because uh, both disease states and all operations within those disease states are viable using minimally invasive surgical techniques if that is what you want to do. So it's really a matter of good clinical care and and uh, evaluation, erring on the side of caution if unsure. Uh, I think very few surgeons regret doing a total colectomy on a temporary basis and returning to fight another day with better pathology. And as I uh, mentioned earlier on, beware of increased operative morbidity associated with Remicade. There's very good evidence for that although it is still put forward by a lot of gastroenterologists as not really increasing uh, morbidity, I think we know that that's not really true. Thank you very much.